20 minutes late. Um, I don't see Kim uh, here, but hopefully you know, she'll be able to catch up. So uh, our, our agenda today is pretty straightforward. Uh, we've got basically three items. Talk about oversight of CVH and Whiting. Uh, talk about the PSRB and talk about competency issues. Um, and we, we talked, uh, we, in our previous discussions, we've kind of covered this ground a little bit, uh, especially when it comes to some of the oversight discussions we've had in terms of uh, an inspector general or an ombudsman or putting new powers in the advisory council or whatever. Um, but do you wanna begin with that? Talk about um, the, what we would like to recommend in terms of appropriate oversight for CVH and Whiting. I think my recollection is where we left off, there was, um, we had discussed um, creating some sort of outside entity, which would have the authority to um, investigate any complaints related to uh, abuse, certainly abusive patients, but beyond that, just any kind of concerns about the way the hospital is run. Um, and, and I think there was a discussion about whether this um, entity would have jurisdiction to deal with employee complaints, right? I mean, and then we, I think we kind of got into a discussion about a lot of that would be col uh, covered by collective bargaining with their own very explicit procedures on how those kinds of things are handled. Um, and I see Linda has joined us. Uh, so can you hear me, Linda? Are you? <laughs> Yes, I'm joining you. I just flew down the chimney. Woohoo! There you go. Well, dust your clothes off. And uh, uh, but in any event, we just got started, and I was just mentioning that the agenda uh, calls for a discussion about oversight, which we got into last time, the PSRB and competency restoration. So um, I, I was just kind of retracing Good. the. Go step. ahead. Go ahead. I I need to catch my breath. Go ahead. For it. Okay, so I was just retracing the steps as I recall them from our last discussion. Um, and then there was some discussion about should our recommendation include jurisdiction beyond just CVH whiting um, oh. forensic, right? And, and so uh, we never really settled on any specific recommendations, but let me just throw it open to the floor and uh, what thoughts do people have after you've had an opportunity to chew on it for a couple of weeks? I, I guess my, my first question, Mike, is, you know, I know we're tasked with CVH and Whiting, and so can we make the recommendation that this happen at CVH and Whiting with the suggestion that they might want to look at the other state hospitals as well, yeah. as opposed yeah. to saying, you know, this, this should all go out? That, that certainly doesn't seem inappropriate, right, to, to make a suggestion. Um, and, and I think the, when we talked about this last time, uh, somebody pointed out that all of these facilities technically have their own advisory council, but each of those advisory councils has the same limitations that the CVH Whiting was. They don't really have any authority, so to speak. Um, but there's no reason they shouldn't, right? And, and I think we did mention there's a lot of similar, you know, we have the child advocate and we've got the new inspector general for police, you know, on and on and on. There's a lot of models to look at to how, how you would do this kind of thing. So, Mike, what would we be looking at in terms of actual authority? Um, you know, well, they're not going to have authority to do personnel stuff, as you said. Um, would they have authority to, I don't know, look at records um, and they are not going to probably have authority to make treatment recommendations. But so, I mean, I think when we say authority, I'm not quite sure what authority they could have. Well, you mentioned a few of them. I mean, just for example, to explicitly say they have access to all the information, all the records they would need to look at in order to, to investigate a situation, right? Um, you know, just for example, uh, where I used to work at the Office of Policy and Management, the secretary of OPM actually has the authority to look at anything in any document in state government for the purpose of uh, oversight and management. So 
that's by statute. So you can have a statute that gives authority to an entity to do these things. Now, needless to say, uh, once they have that authority, with that comes the obligation to keep things confidential, especially when we're talking about medical records, right? So, um, and, and so, but that's a type of authority that could be given to um, an investigative body. Another one is like subpoena powers, right? Could you get documents from, you know, even if you have the authority to get information or documents from the agency, uh, would you also have the authority to get documents from elsewhere? Right, as part of your investigation. So that's that's another kind of authority. And, and the third thing I think is the explicit jurisdiction and charge you give to, to this entity, right? I mean, you tell them what things they're allowed to investigate and that carries with it its own authority. So those are the kinds of things I, I think right. options here. But that's investigative tools. I'm sort of looking at the end product so are, are we thinking, is, is this a quasi-judicial agency with the authority to set out any kind of order? And if right. there's an order that's set out, then I think there would due process would require that there be a 4183 appeal, an APA appeal. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we're gonna, because if we're gonna give them authority to, to, um, issue any kind of an order that has an impact on somebody's life, whether it be treatment or personnel, which is its own issue. I don't think you can do that without according due process. So mm -hmm. those are great investigative tools and I think those all make sense, but then what is the authority to do with this investigation once you've completed it? If, if it's just an investigation to make recommendations, then make recommendations to what body? And then if it's just recommendations, that doesn't have a whole lot of teeth. So I'm just sort of thinking these things out aloud as I'm babbling. Right. So, so, so I, I think if you looked at the other models that are out there, right, um, of course, you know, if you gave this entity the or, the authority to actually order people to do things, for example, take some action, um, I, I think now you're in a whole different area, right? Uh, like the, the classic inspector general type, you know, they have the authority to get access to information and they have the authority to to issue reports and recommendations. So there's that. And, and I think by and large, that kind of thing is, is very effective. It's influential, right? Uh, you can also... Uh, require, um, you know, if the, I, let's say there was an inspector general type entity and they made a recommendation or findings and recommendation, you could require the, the relevant authority to actually respond to that in writing and either agree or disagree. And then, you know, so for example, it could be DEMIS, it could be the administration of the hospital itself. You know, you could require them, let's say within 30 days to respond and, and explain what they're going to do about it, you know. So those are the kinds of things that seem sort of standard for these types of investigative. I mean, they're, they're more like prosecutors, investigators and prosecutors than they are like judges, I would think, you know. Right. And so they would, like in the case of something like criminal abuse or criminal neglect, they would refer it to the police or, you know, along yeah. those lines. Yeah. Probably right to DPH as well, right? Mm hmm. So I think it, it makes sense to have, like, I mean, Mike, you've outlined a number of times now, like kind of the, the inspector general model or um, the model that's been adopted, like through the police accountability laws and things like that. I think that's made a lot of sense that having this independent body that has the ability to come in, gather information, review records, make recommendations, um, and, and, and sort of disseminate that out. There are other, you know, if it rises to the level of a DPH violation, then they could be notified and they would come in and, and then they could order things to happen. Um, same thing with the, with the criminal investigation. So I think it, it just, it provides another layer of an independent body that has eyes on things, to be able to bring things to people's attention. And I, I do think that that is probably sufficient. And in, in, in that regard, I think there's a couple of options too, right? You can, 
let's say there's an individual who holds this position. Let's just say for the time being inspector general, uh, you could give her or him the authority to do this on their own, right? Or you could do it where they would uh, make their report and, and recommendations, give it to some sort of advisory group, right? Or a council or, and, and, and they in turn would either, uh, they would discuss in the same way we are, you know, a, a group like ours, right? With representatives of different points of view would talk about what to make of it. And then they in turn could vote to demand that the, the commissioner or the whoever's running the hospital respond to that. You know, I mean, so you could vest the authority solely in the individual who holds the job, or you could give that person the authority to do the investigation, make some uh, recommended findings and, and recommendations to some other entity, which in turn would consider it and then vote on what to do about it. So, I, I, I would rather see it go to an oversight board than to just have one person with that power so that they're, that the person makes the recommendation to the board and then the board can decide what they want to do with it with them, with them having accountability on it. And that being the board that we've talked about that has persons with lived experience yeah. on it. Right. Um, right. A forensic person and people with lived experience and, you know, right. Just, a just a point that, you know, uh, inspector generals can only make recommendations. The people that they're making the recommendations to don't have to take those recommendations. Right, right. You, I think we're looking for something with a little bit more teeth in it. Well, as I said, I think you, you can by law say that once they make their recommendation, the responsible entity has to respond to it within a certain time frame and either agree or not agree and give reasons why, you know, I mean, you could really force people to do stuff as opposed to just put a report on a shelf. I mean, th right. that's, that's the model um, that, that has emerged now with these uh, police oversight type entities, you know, so. And I guess the other question would be, and maybe this is getting too much into the weeds that um, the inspector general or his or her or their designee, um, if because um, it, it, it be, could, could become cumbersome for one person to be doing all of the investigations. Yeah. So that's just you know. Yeah. A minor well, I mean, do it. You want to make sure they have appropriate staffing. To, to right. Right. An individual, you know, but someone holds the title using again the inspector general model. Someone will hold that title there. They're the boss, right? And then right. they have a staff, just like the child advocate has a staff, right? And, right. Uh, but I think unlike the child advocate who, uh, you know, issues reports, but I'm not sure anybody necessarily has to do anything no, with them. They don't. They require by law, as is the case with a lot of these police oversight entities now, that people have to respond to it and have to either agree or disagree or explain what they're going to do about it. And, and that kind of thing sort of forces action. Because, you know, after all, the, you know, in theory, at least there is oversight, right? There's the commissioner oversees the hospital, the commissioner reports to the governor. Um, if the, you know, I, I mean, there is that mechanism in place, I, I think, but it's that outside perspective that, that can maybe say things that other people might be reluctant to say because they might be embarrassing. Would so. you have to also amend the statutes of the, agencies that do have authority to issue orders so that they would um, have an, that part of their mandate would be to respond to reports from the inspector general and somehow figure out a way to make that a, a substantive response instead of thanks we'll we'll you know yeah. we'll file it away so well, I, I think which I mean in, so I think in this case there's multiple oversight, authorities, right? There's right. the Department of Public Health and there's DMIS and, you know, et cetera, prosecutors. Um, you could just, let, you know, you could give the authority to the inspector general as an individual or to whatever entity the IG reports to, like the advisory council or the whatever. And, and you could give them the authority to identify who they want to respond to this. And you could, you know, in statute say that if they say that 
they needed a response from the prosecutors or from DPH or from the commissioner or from the CEO of the hospital, whatever, you know, I'm, yeah. right. as long as it's in statute, you know, it's, it, it's obligatory. And, and I think that's worth noting. Dr. Rodas. Yeah. So I just want to take a pause to make sure, cause I think, we're, I think we have consensus. I just want to you know, make sure everyone's had a chance to weigh in. I think what I'm hearing and I totally agree is that we're in agreement that some degree of oversight is required. Uh, is there anybody on the call that questions that at this point? So that, that's something I know, right? So we're really just now debating the, what is that structure? And I think we have consensus too, that whatever that title of that position or person or group is, is that they have some teeth uh, to their actions. They don't just say, suggest you do this or suggest you do that. They actually can hold people accountable. Uh, and I think it's particularly important under the current structure um, because we certainly have, which is why you have inspectors general anyway. It's a little bit of, you know, we have a fox watching the hen house, so to speak. And that, and you see how that can get you right over several years of, of, of you know, you can, there's a lot of ways you could bury your dead, uh, uh, literally and figuratively. So I, I think we agree to that. And I, I would totally agree. I, I think um, I, I appreciate this dialogue. I'm all in for Again, title, I'm not the bureaucrat to really understand what, what the best structure is for that. I'll leave that to the legislature and, and, and the attorneys uh, who are here. But uh, I, I think I, I think we're trying to make sure we had agreement. So. Linda's got, Linda. Go ahead, Linda. I think that we've, we've described what we want the entity to be. And that is what we should state. I, I don't know if it, I agree with Paul. It, it has to be more than one person. It has, and it also in many respects has to be a process. But that, well, when you think about uh, having someone investigate, um, then do they report to the public health commission? Because sometimes let's, sometimes there are uh, instances when the commissioner may or may not be the root of the problem. Um, who who would um, if it is it, if it is constituted by the General Assembly? Um, is it redundant? And other things that are being done are available within the system now. At at the at the, the Department of Veterans Affairs, we did not um, have most of this was handled by. Um, our our uh, personnel. When when anyone had stolen anything, anyone had wronged a patient, it just went right straight to the um, personnel, and it and it and it was whether they were discharged or not. I have no idea how many um, staff and, and people this at, at right uh, Whiting End and um, CVH. How many staff you have, but. Um, I have wondered when looking at the overtime and some of the conditions, the working conditions, I've wondered who's in charge of all of this and is there and no one that they can actually right now go to? Is there someone that's they're supposed to be able to uh, apprise of these issues and they're not doing their job or they're not, the position's not filled? What is the process now? So why don't we address uh, Linda's first question because so I, we talked about, uh, you know, who are the, in theory at least, the the official oversight agencies for CVH and for Whiting, right? And so there's Department of Public Health, DEMIS, DCJ have different roles to play. Are there other state entities that would be the the the, the kinds of authorities to which you would like to? have this inspector general be able to make recommendations and require a response? I mean, or who's who's not on that list? State Should police, because the state police. Well, um, DCJ gets you there anyways. I mean, they're the- yeah. It'll get you there for the, for the, um, for the um, Demas police? Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, and you, you, you also have CMS though that's involved. But see, that's a federal thing. That's so yeah. Federal. You can't, can't do that. Okay. 
I don't, well, first of um, all, in, in terms of where it should be seated, I, it can't be seated in any of these agencies. No, no. It's a standalone um, inspector general um, who reports directly to the governor. Um, so um, it's-, well, it's so, Can I just address that for a second? Yeah. Uh, it has to be somewhere, right? It can be somewhere for administrative purposes OPM. only. Yeah, so, but it has to be somewhere. Okay, so um, no right. PM. Uh, there's pros and there's cons to that, having worked <laughs> with this. But yeah. uh, uh, the, the other uh, question, and, and if you do it just for administrative purposes, they have no actual authority over it other than just administering their payroll and stuff like that. Um, the, um, the, 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 what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, to whom do they report, right? That's the key thing. If you create sort of like a, a, a commission of some type, you know, like with the representative people on it and have the IG report to them. That's, you know, that's the way, you know, like for example, the Sieges project, which I won't go into all the details. That was, uh, this is the building, this system where law enforcement agencies all have access to the records they need to have is one of the outgrowths of the Cheshire murder. There is a Sieges governing board that consists of some, you know, variety of people and the executive director of Sieges reports to that board and they are under, desk, I guess, for administrative purposes, but they're independent. You know what I'm saying? So uh, if you have them report to the governor, there is a downside to that too, because at the end of the day, some of the stuff might be embarrassing. And, um, you know, if they think that's the boss, you know, they might be reluctant to say something. So uh, regardless of what the, who the governor is, I'm not in any way uh, casting aspersions on the current governor, but I'm just saying like, I would be careful about to whom this inspector general actually reports, like who can hire and fire them is what it boils down to. So Paul. Um, I really like the idea of an oversight committee with teeth and having the inspector general report to them and having the inspector general with, with, with teeth so that there, that it's not a political process. It's, it's to a committee that has some, I don't want to say fiduciary responsibility because that's a that's a state function financially, but it has some some responsibility in the operations of Whiting and CVH. Okay. And just as an aside, I just want to point out that there's a separate discussion going on about having an entity just like we're describing for the Department of Corrections, which used to exist until like 2004 or something. It was one of the things that Roland got rid of, but, but it's, it's the same concept. Like, where do you put them? To whom do they report? What kind of authority do they have? And, and the, I'm only saying this because I believe the legislature is trying to figure that out for Department of Corrections during this. And it's also year. part of the protect bill. It's, it's one of yeah, the provisions exactly. of the protect bill. So if that goes through an inspector general is, is part of that as well. So I'm just saying this, discussion is happening already just in a slightly different context so mike are we getting too much into is this the kind of thing where we're getting too specific and that you know because a lot of times we'll say things and you'll say well this is what the legislature is going to want to yeah. work out for themselves so or are you thinking of giving a more fully fleshed out um recommendation well i think you know, obviously I only speak for myself here, but- What but, you think, yeah. Just... Yeah, um, but I, I think, you know, broad outlines are what we're describing. You know, there should be some type of inspector general, there should be some type of an oversight commission. The oversight commission should consist of, you know, uh, the relevant stakeholders. Um, they should have X number of powers. Now, exactly who appoints whom or what exactly all those constituent groups are gonna be, like that's typical legislative detail, but, uh, but, but I think it's the concept, you know, just like we discussed earlier, we recommend that they begin the process for replacing the, the Whiting facility, right? I mean, that's, there's a lot of complicated details that go along with doing that, but just recommending that, you know, however they want to proceed, they should get started. I mean, that's more or less what we're talking about. Okay. Right. Laurie? Yeah, I'm, I kind of follow along that, that same line of thinking. I think that um, you know, in writing up something for a report, we're going to talk about accountability and oversight. And I think 
you know, two of the um, two of the charges that they outlined for us uh, are directly what we're talking about. Evaluate the feasibility of an independent standalone Office of Inspector General, and evaluate the membership of the Wedding Advisory Board. I think those kind of dovetail into what we're, we've been talking about. And I think it makes sense to recommend that um, that they consider, you know, um, developing this Office of whatever if it's called Inspector General, that they report to the advisory board and that board should be expanded to include other stakeholders and to have, um, uh, you know, be able to get more data more readily and be able to make recommendations that have to be responded to by the uh, commissioner and, and, and things of that nature. I, I think we can kind of keep it, I mean, that sounds a little specific, but I think we can keep it that broad without getting into all the weeds. So um, I, I just made a few notes here just so we can keep track of what we're talking about. We talked about the create the creation of some type of an IG type function, right? Reporting to a commission that it's properly staffed, that it have uh, the authority to review any records that the, the relevant hospital has with the condition that you know, they, they, like everybody who works in the hospital is mandated to keep it confident, the identities of individuals confidential. Um, and that, uh, what about the whole subpoena topic? I mean, there are other entities that are getting subpoena power. So I'm just wondering. Mike, yeah. step back for a second in terms of records. Does HIPAA have an exception for um, um, investigative bodies? Yeah. I so, think it does. It do, yeah. So like if the if the police get a subpoena for someone's medical records, like classic drunk driving accident, somebody gets taken to the ER, they suspect they're drunk, they get a search warrant to go look at the, uh, get the person's actual blood alcohol content from the emergency room medical records. So there's an exception for investigative procedures. Okay. As long as there's how, how does it work with P&A, Nancy? Um, P&A is entitled to all of that stuff, um, HIPAA doesn't apply to the PNAs, so um, there's no issue in terms of that. Um, the PNA has to keep the material in the same confidential manner as the keeper of the records. That's how the statute is worded. Right. So a PNA has access to all these records that we're talking about as well. For the most part, I mean, you there, there are, it's with consent of the subject of the records, and then there are some specific um, ways that a PNA can get records um, without consent, absent consent. Most of the time when you're doing an investigation, you have consent. So this is something a PNA could do. I don't want to see the PNA um, become the inspector general. Um, I think that would be wrong, um, but um, the PNA does have access to these records as well without needing a subpoena. But again, that's the, that's the kind of thing, you know, there may be some details that we're not aware of. And, you know, if the legislature floated a proposal like this, I'm sure they'd get feedback from all the, all the, various perspectives, law enforcement and elsewhere about, you know, the pros and cons of a subpoena and how that would actually work. You know what right. I'm saying? So maybe we just put in that we want to make sure that the inspector general has all the tools necessary to be able to complete the task of an investigation. Yeah. And and let the, let the legislature figure out what those tools are. What, what the inspector general could not do vis-a-vis -vis the PNA, the inspector general could not subpoena records from the PNA that the PNA got. The inspector general would have to get them on his or her own because the PNA would not have the authority to turn them over to somebody even subject to subpoena. Is that a, is that a statute that says that? It, there's not a statute that says that they don't have to respond to a subpoena, but there's a statute that says they have to keep them confidential in the same manner as the records um, are kept confidential by the keeper of the records. 
So um, even though, for example, um, a PNA um, is not subject to HIPAA, um, they couldn't turn over records that would be required to be kept confidential by HIPAA. Okay. It's also part of a, um, um, from the PNA perspective, that they're not to be used as a tool for other investigative agencies. And this happens a lot with private attorneys who represent um, plaintiffs. Um, they're not there to be used as a conduit for records that another party could not otherwise get. Right. And you have to get them on your own, use your own subpoena power. Okay. Okay. Um, in terms of how we I want- could, I would just add to the, um, to the list of thing, of details there that, that we make it clear that it be encompassing complaints from both patients and employees, mm -hmm. right? Because I think at this point, um, like really employees only recourse, staffs really only recourse as far as uh, raising things um, for scrutiny is, is through the union um, and, you know, through labor management discussions and things like that. And so I, I think that maybe they would appreciate having an additional outlet but wouldn't the that. union have to agree to that, though, through collective bargaining? I mean, some of the things I think certainly are going to be governed by collective bargaining, but it might just be another outlet to raise issues for other, you know, to bring to, to light for other um, this other advisory board to, to consider. And it's also I mean, keep in mind, there's an existent uh, whistleblower statute that provides protection to employees who bring to people's attention misconduct. Right. So. Uh, um, how that would dovetail with this is comp. I think the whistleblower statute requires you to go to the state auditors and, and stuff like that. So, but there are certainly uh, things that are that any employee has the authority to do, notwithstanding the collective bargaining process to, to bring, you know, evidence of misconduct to an entity that can investigate it. And then with that, they're protected from any disciplinary, you know, any retaliatory uh, discipline and stuff, uh, stuff like that. I'm just curious. So we've talked about entertaining complaints from patients and employees. I'm guessing you wouldn't want to limit it to that. So for example, a family member or an advocate would also be able to bring to the, anybody really could bring to the attention of the right. idea. Yeah. One, one, one thing I thought of while Laurie was talking with employee stuff, it might be good to have an annual report on the racial disparities that people are reporting to take a look at um, you know, how, how employees are being treated along racial lines that if black people are get, ending up in, you know, getting verbal warnings and written warnings more than, um, you know, you know, to kind of take a look at that from an equity standpoint. But one thing so that was careful about um, is I can see the legislator wanting to fold this into CHRO in some manner. Um, so when, and I agree with, with what you're saying, and I like the idea of an annual report and, and equity and stuff, but, um, I think that when you start getting to some of that kind of stuff, you're going to get some people who say CHRO is already doing some of this and they already have the right to file complaints with CHRO, um, and CHRO already provides um, investigations and has the authority to get records, blah, blah, blah. So we just something to, to keep in the back of our minds. We, we don't want to do that. And, and also, I think it's worth noting that the skill set required to do those types of investigations is very different than the skill set required to do investigations about appropriate patient care and stuff like that. I mean, HR stuff and, and healthcare stuff seem like two different worlds, right? So, uh, you know, by the way, I just wanna, I, I forwarded all of you just a, a few minutes ago, but I just wanna read it because there's people watching. Uh, an update on the uh, survey that we have authorized to take place with employees. Uh, I reached out to Sarah Wakai from University of Connecticut Health Center. And she said, uh, we're working on the questions for the three primary constructs, worker morale, management, and bullying. 
Uh, we are considering a few existing surveys. The benefits would be that they have established reliability. However, some of the surveys may have associated costs and or may require that we share data, which I do not believe is possible or even a good idea. Um, in addition, existing surveys may not measure exactly what the task force, um, hold on, sorry, what the, what the task force legislation needs to be measured. We also have kept in mind that whatever we select or create respondents must be able to complete the survey within 20 minutes, which is limited given the constructs needed to be assessed. So uh, she says so she's been in touch with Lori and asked to help consolidate the job classifications. We will need that for the background question. So that's an update as of you know less than an hour ago on, uh, on the survey because I know how important that is and we're sort of waiting for those results before we can sort of really dive into that topic. And I'll just add to that, Mike, um, I was gonna let the rest of the task force know that um, Sarah had reached out to me to ask some questions about preparing the demographic um, related to the hospital. So there's a, a, a huge number of job classes that um, that DEEM has provided for the, the covers both hospitals. And so I'm trying to uh, help her basically narrow those down into different um, groups to make it more manageable. So you don't have 110 different choices. Um, and also uh, just asking, answering some of the questions she had in, in outlining the demographics of the hospitals. Okay. I only brought that up because the, the topic of adding that to the IG jurisdiction had just come up. So that's where that is. So my guess is we'll have a separate set of recommendations related to uh, dealing with the, the kinds of concerns involving uh, racial discrimination or disparities in terms of the way employees are um, hired and fired and disciplined, so. Okay. Uh, so annual report from this inspector general entity, I, I, that seemed like a good idea. I mean, that's sort of standard for those types of offices, right? Just summary of the kind, number of complaints they've received, what the outcomes were and any recommendations they've made, that kind of thing, and, and what the follow-up was, right? Okay. Um, what else on that? Anything? Okay. Want to move on to PSRB? Okay. So the, my, my recollection of our last discussion of this was that that um, there was either a get rid of the whole thing altogether or b. Um, uh, reconsider the, the legislation that was introduced a couple of years ago that made some pretty wholesale changes, but still preserved the actual PSRB entity. So that's, I, I don't think we ever got to consensus on that, but let's talk about it. And there, um, I, I guess I would say a third option would be something, recommendations for modifications that don't completely dovetail with that piece of legislation because there were there were things in that that I agree with, things that I don't that I think should be slightly different or worded a little bit differently. Nancy? Well I was just gonna say, you know, I love the idea of getting rid of rid of the PSRB, but then um, we have to figure out what you're replacing it with. And mm -hmm. I don't have an answer to that. Mm -hmm. And you know the last thing I want to see is another task force designed to figure out what to do um, in, in lieu of the PSRB or, you know, it'd be great. I'd love to defer to the public defenders because I'm sure my friend Monty Radler could come up with something great, but I'm not sure that's what would pass. Um, so I, the question, you know, becomes, do we, you know, go for the whole ball of wax or do something that has already, the, the, the basic work has been done. Um, and, um, and then see, you know, d if that's gonna make a difference um, over time, because it's really hard for, we're not gonna be able to come up with an answer to what then. My recollection of that legislation was, I mean, there was a lot of elements of it, but, but seemed like the most significant part of it was sort of providing a equal weight or at least an equal weight to the 
to the well-being of the patient um, as opposed to public safety, right? It seems like the current law is heavily weighted towards public safety. And, um, and, and so, but maybe, I mean, would it be worth kind of going item by item through that proposed legislation and see are there, you know, which of those things we have consensus around or, or what do you think? Um, can I, can I say a few pieces in that respect? All right. Um, so, I mean, I guess I'll just say that uh, I, I do think there are a couple of benefits. We are one of three states that have the PSRB. I do think there are a couple of benefits of having the PSRB. Um, as I said before, um, it provides some separation from the folks doing the treating to the folks making the decisions around risk. Um, and it does consider that other element of protect, protection of public safety. Um, it also provides a place, an adversarial process that provides oversight, um, not just for the, the, the patients as they progress through the system, but the hospital to make sure that the hospital is doing what it needs to do. And that somebody on, you know, is there to represent both sides at each hearing to be able to essentially, uh, you know, if the hospital is not making a recommendation for change to demand why and to demand what needs to happen and to have somebody represent those interests in that adversarial setting. Um, uh, also, if we look at the article that uh, I think it was Monty that shared with us um, that looked at the uh, folks um, after being released from the hospital or being discharged from the PSRP in Connecticut and the rates of recidivism are extremely low, uh, particularly low in comparison to other um, other states with different models. So I do think that there are those things that need to be considered. With respect to modifications, um, as I said, I do agree with some of the things that they proposed. Um, I do think that there should be an end to the recommitment, the potential for recommitment. And then when someone reaches the end of their commitment, they should be uh, treated in the same way as um, anyone else in the sense that if there's still danger, they should be um, Uh, brought before the probate court for civil commitment. Um, I, I, as I think I made the recommendation in um, the things that we circulated among us for not removing the, the PSRB completely um, or, or the voice of the PSRB completely for the internal hospital movements, but allowing the parties to be able to stipulate to that so that there could be um, uh, an, an absence of a hearing, just notification to the board if both um, both parties agree, and if there was a dis uh, disagreement, then then there could be a hearing to have that. So just providing that extra option of allowing the parties to stipulate to an opinion to move somebody from Whiting to Dutcher without having to have a full hearing. And then the final piece is um, about the um, the language uh, changing the language from solely protection of the public or society and adding. Um, consideration to the welfare of the patient. So as I, I've scanned a number of statutes in their states and, and they do say that, um, they, don't, they don't equate them. They don't say that these things are exactly equal. Um, some of them explicitly say that, uh, that, that favor should go toward the protection of public, but they do add that element so that it's there and it's clear that there is also consideration to the welfare of the patient along with protection of the public. Those are kind of the, the, in a nutshell, the things that I um, concur with. Any other? Yeah, Mike. Um, one of the things I think we have to keep in mind when we think about all this stuff are these are folks who've been found not guilty. Um, now they have been found not guilty by reason of insanity, but they have been found not guilty. They're not criminals. Um, they're not to use the word that DOC uses, which is probably the word I hate the most um, when talking about these kinds of issues. They're not offenders. Um, they are patients and they are um, patients of the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. And um, I think we go um, a very long way um, by not making um, concerns for their treatment to be an afterthought and to have less weight than, than safety. Um, I don't think that there's um, any real reason to treat them differently than any other um, 
esteem as client, depending upon um, their treatment plan and perhaps the level of illness. But again, that you can treat, you know, somebody with the same level of illness, whether they've, um, they're an NGRI or whether they're a civil commitment. Um, so I'd like to approach this from not looking at the um, issue of, of fear and dangerousness that always gets seen to, that's always associated with the, the folks at Whiting and, and Lesser so at Dutcher, if this is supposed to be a kinder, gentler way of looking at it, then um, it can't be um, look, looking out for, for their well being um, and their rights um, cannot be secondary. Um, and um, so I'd have some really strong objections to, if we're gonna use the language of the statute that's there of watering this down because it barely creates that equity and to water it down, there's gonna be a total absence of any equity. So, um, well. Yeah, and I mean, this is just discrimination against people with a mental health diagnosis. Why would we, how could we even start to call this justice if we're saying it's already tilted against you? Um, and so, you know, I think that, you know, we really need to be looking at that. You know, I agree, there should be no recommitment, but as soon as that recommitment comes, if there's a civil commitment, it should be outside of Whiting. They should be transferred to CVH. Um, and, and, but that, that should come with some due process too. I mean, I, I know of a guy who got off the PSRB in August and he's still in Whiting and they're blaming COVID for, for that. Um, you know, so where, it, where is the equity? Where is, where is the fact that we're actually here to treat uh, people who the state has deemed to be um, so incapacitated that they couldn't control what, what was going on in their lives and that we're restoring them, you know? I, th I think that, you know, as soon as the NGRI plea um, is, is, is affirmed, like all, all uh, DOC involvement should be, should be out of it. All criminal justice involvement is, is done, right? It's been adjudicated. So, uh, but Laura, correct me if I'm wrong, perhaps Laura, you know best, um, there are non-forensic patients at Whiting, right? There are, are there not? Uh, there, I mean, there are there are patients in Whiting other than not guilty by reason of insanity and competency. Yes, and, there are civil patients or and, voluntary. And how so, do they end up in? I mean, they, they would otherwise be at CVH if they required, yes. right? So, what is the process by which you can be a non-forensic patient end up at Whiting? Um, so there's um, for like the the competency patients that we have that are end up being non-restorable. Um, that's one outlet or one one way that they become civil. Um, so if they're non-restorable, the Superior Court can order them to um, stay at Whiting, uh, the, the Hot Whiting Hospital, for civil commitment, and then they get converted to a civil commitment uh, patient or uh, oftentimes the probate. The judge will let them sign involuntarily if he thinks they're able to do that. So that's one option. And then the other option is um, through superintendent's transfer from other hospitals. So if somebody is um, uh, not able to be managed appropriately at one of the other hospitals, CVH, Greater Bridgeport, so on and so forth, they will transfer them, superintendents transfer them to Whiting um, for a period of time. That's just to be clear about without any involvement of, of criminal charges or prosecutors or criminal judges making orders, right? So it's, so, cause I, well, cause one question I would anticipate is like, if there is a patient who is, however you want to define it, cannot be properly and safely managed in, the, in a, like at CPH or, or Connecticut Mental Health, they could theoretically be sent to Whiting, even though they've never been charged with a crime. It's got nothing to do with any criminal prosecution, right? So it's not by uh, 
because I just want to get to what the point Paul was making. It's like you could end up in whiting even if you weren't a NGRI or a competency, right? It's just, right. it's possible. Yes. But, but I, I would think there would have to be some recent violence involved in that in order for that to take place. Um, you know. For the, for the superintendent's transfers, yes. It's usually because of some sort of violence or ongoing violence that they haven't been able to manage at another hospital and they uh, get sent to us. Um, for the competencies though, the, the competencies that end up non, you know, sub, non restorable and then become some commitment, they may have had no acts of violence. Those are the ones that we try to get out as soon as possible, of course. Right. I mean, I think, I think using maximum security for a civil commitment where there, where there hasn't been a recent case of violence or anything like that it is using a sledgehammer to hang a picture. But, but I'm only saying it sounds like there is some, you know, whether it's fair or not is another issue, but it sounds like there's some sort of process where under certain circumstances, uh, a patient who has no forensic involvement could be transferred to Whiting and presumably that would be based on uh, safety concerns, violence, that type of thing. But I'm, ju I'm just pointing out that outside of the criminal justice system, outside of competency, outside of NGRI, there may be patients who would require the equivalent of a maximum security setting, right? So now, how frequently that should happen and whether it's overused, it's, uh, those are all other issues, but I'm just pointing out it's, it's, you're not eliminating the possibility that that would happen under certain circumstances. I, Dr. Rode has had his hand up and, and Nancy. Had yeah, I had a, well, so, so uh, just to remind everybody at St. Francis, we had, uh, you know, at, at the Mount Sinai campus, the, the hospital pretty much is a behavioral health hospital and with several locked uh, units of adult and adolescent and child behavioral health. And we indeed would have some patients that uh, nobody ever got shipped out to Whiting unless there were indeed violence uh, and or significant risks to harm to other patients or our staff. Uh, so they're always a precipitating factor. What I don't know is, and, and Laurie, I, because I, I, I was able to, knew, knew enough to follow that loop, how that works. I mean, I know we, I know we're sending, I don't know how they come back. And what I don't know is how many, what, what could you give us a sense of order of magnitude? How many people in Whiting fall into that category who come from the myriad of mental health uh, inpatient facilities across the state uh, and up there in that capacity? Is it a small number? I, I'm guessing it's a relatively small number, but I don't really know. It, it's smaller than any other, it's certainly smaller than the number of comps that we have or the number of PSRBs that we have. Um, I'd have to, to think through to give you like a, a percentage of the total right now, but um, maybe and for the whole hospital, maybe 10 or 20%. Uh, I, feel like, I feel like Dr. Wasser gave us these, the breakdowns of this a long time ago. So I'd have to refer back to that. Plus things have changed a little bit uh, over the past year um, because our, um, our competency numbers are, are way down because the courts slowed down a bit, um, stopped for a while, but slowed down a bit. And uh, so we've actually, um, we probably have a higher proportion of civil patients right now because we've been able to, to take individuals that other hospitals were struggling with, um, particularly because we have a low census right now. So um, Can I that doesn't- more, What's the mechanism for these transfers? I mean, is, is there a probate court judge involved or is there some court order? Is it purely like if one of the patients at uh, Dr. Rodas's former facility, if they felt they couldn't manage them. Is it just automatic? Is it just kind of, I mean, how, how does it get approved? Do you know? Um, so it, through the medical director for DMS, which is Dr. DK. Um, so I, so I, no involved at all. The, the medical right. director of one hospital will call up the medical director of another hospital and say, hey, we have this patient and there's a form they fill out where they articulate the reasons why they need them to be transferred. And then essentially the thing gets blessed by the uh, um, Demas is medical director for them to move. If the patient is under a voluntary status in the other hospital, there may need to be some looping in of probate or we would have to take them to probate after they got here. I, I'm not sure about that mechanism, but as far as a civil going from one hospital to another, 
superintendent's transfer governed by um, the medical director for DEMAS. Nancy. And there's another class of patients that get transferred and that's um, from DOC. Um, there, there are patients who were not NGRI um, and are either you know, pre-trial or post-sentence who for whatever reason get transferred from usually Garner, um, sometimes Northern um, to, to Whiting. Um, and so that's a completely different set of requirements. And so there is no civil commitment, um, but, um, and I'm, the, I'm not quite sure what, if anything, the um, Superior Court has to do to um, have a, a transfer, but, but that happens. But what I think was really good about you raising this, Mike, was talking about these different kinds of patients at Whiting and getting back to the topic of PSRB, is somebody supposed to wear a label or uh, their wristband? It says, well, you can treat me this way because I'm civil and I'm not NGRI. So you have to give, look at, at my um, comfort level. Um, you have to give it a higher level of scrutiny than my roommate who is an NGRI. And I mean, you can't do that, obviously. It would, it would, it would be ludicrous. Um, so it, it's another reason that a holistic approach to a hospital that's supposed to be focused on recovery, no matter what category the patient fits into, should not care so much what, what category they fit into um, and should be treating them all with the same level of commitment to their recovery and to their well being and their comfort, and not do this discrimination based upon um, how you got into the system. So, and, and I see Lori's got her hand up, and, and I, and, and <laughs> as, as does Linda, but I just on that point, Lori, are patient, are there different restrictions and privileges? among patients based on the status in which they're in Whiting or Dutcher? I no. mean, they're all, they're all, it's one size fits all in terms of how they're treated. In yes, terms of the medical. A, at, all right, at, um, like at Dutcher, there's a level system that all mm -hmm. the, any, if you're there for probate or you're there as a probate commitment or you're there as PSRB, it's the same mechanism. It's the same uh, steps you go through. It's the same things you have to do in order to earn these privileges. So you wouldn't know you wouldn't know whether you know one individual was a probate versus the other one was a PSRB. And certainly the treatments offered are, are provided um, to those. The, the difference between them is the mechanisms for um, the, the govern their release because obviously the PSRBs fall under that, <clears throat> that statute. And there is a distinction, I think, between the folks that come through as um, NGRI and end up under the PSRB in terms of the um, this is a criminal justice process. They, they pled, uh, they, they used, they raised their mental health as a defense so that they would not be punished for what they did that they weren't able to control, but so they would be treated for it. But it doesn't negate the act. The individuals are admitting to the act when they come to us. And that is typically murder, very serious sexual assault or other assaults. That's different than somebody breaking windows in another facility that then gets sent and, 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 and making threats to, to her harm staff that then gets sent to Whiting as a civil transfer. So they, they're not quite the same. And there is a, the mechanism through the, so everything under the PSRB or with the, the, the folks under the PSRB is still tied to the superior court, the, the court of original jurisdiction. They're the ones that has to ultimately say, okay, these folks are now out of the jurisdiction of the PSRB. So they're still tied to the superior court to that, to that criminal case the whole time. Right, which is, but they're not guilty. And which is, again, one of the reasons that we think the PSRB should be eliminated. It makes no sense. Treatment is the same, no matter how you enter the system. No. The PSRB is what makes people guilty, not guilty. I mean, that's, 
in every state where there is NGRI, everybody is found not guilty on the basis of their mental illness. It has nothing to do with whether it's a PSRV or not. Linda. But they, they admit to the act, they committed the act. It's their mental state that's the question. I, I have a question. Dr. Botus, when someone is a patient at St. Francis in the psych unit and becomes a problem, who, as you described, they, they, it's too much for the, uh, this facility to handle. What if you didn't have Whiting? Would you send them? Where would you send them? I have no idea. And and the and the point being is, you know, within the veterans community again, we have a lot of those people. We don't send them. We don't send them to Whiting. And and I am I am kind of concerned that a patient without. Uh, I mean, I could see we've had instances where pay, some of the veterans have uh, committed violent acts and we call the police and then they pay for them into the, out of the VA system into the civil system. But it, it's, uh, it's cause, kind of a concern that um, one, the continuum of kinds of levels of care that we really need to address the issues of patient care it, it, that that doesn't really exist when you have people who are very violent but are not uh, have not committed a crime and end up in Whiting where they're all treated the same. Um, I think it's I think it's a I think there's a little difference in that. I don't think these are long term. Uh, I think Lori articulated it. I think it's the you know it's overwhelming the staff. There's a violent, there's a, there's, there's actually been a violent act. There's usually attack of a staff member or attack of another patient uh, that the staff don't have, either don't feel safe and or don't have the resources, right? So what would happen probably to answer your question, I think about it would be, it would then become a civil matter. We would actually call the police and, and then it would become a criminal act. So uh, in that regard, this actually might be better. Uh, but again, I, I don't want to get out over my skis on this because I'm showing not the expert what happens to these patients. But so consider if you think your Uncle Joe is in St. Francis or Yale, New Haven, and they, and they find out they're at Whiting. Um, how would you explain that, that they became so violent that they, and without uh, an intervention of a court, they were sent in, uh, to a Whiting? Well, pay, remember, patients get transferred from one acute care hospital to another acute care hospital. I know that all the time. I know these, that. So, remind everybody: these are hospitals, <laughs> they're not prisons, right? So, we're transferring from a hospital that can deliver higher level of care. So, just like you would go from Bristol Hospital potentially to or Day Kimball Hospital to St. Francis uh, Cardiac Unit, because you're overwhelming their capabilities to take care of the patient. This is kind of the analogous situation on the behavioral health side. And I, I, think it, I think it is important that when there is a report of who the patient population is at Whiting, that that be, that be a, a, a data point. Because if we think we have 117 people who are not guilty by NGRI, but some of them actually are just uh, unmanageable in the, in the private sector. So, so uh, and then the idea that they would not be treated the same. Is that what I heard you say, Dr. Hauser? They would be right in the milieu of, uh, of writing? Right. Yeah, when you say not, that they would be offered the same, the, the, the patients that are on the long, not, not talking about the competency patients, which has a different focus and a different mission, but the patients in the long-term units at Whiting Building and at, on the units at Dutcher would be offered the same types of treatments, the same privilege level systems, they'd be able to earn the same level of priv privileges and, and things of that nature. They, they're they not treated differently. It's the, the, the mechanism on the, on the um, for them to leave for the, the folks that are PSRB is governed by the criminal court process. And that's but true for nice. any and if they were not PSRB patients, that would be a clinical decision. Say that again. 
if they were not uh, PSRB oh. patients, that would be a, 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 an entirely clinical decision. Yes. And, and, and Nancy, you or sorry, Linda, you asked the question um, to Dr. Rhodes, what would happen if you couldn't send such a patient to Whiting, for example? And my guess is if there was no, if you couldn't manage the patient and the patient was violent, your option would be what everyone else's last resort option is you would call the police and they'd be arrested and they'd be in DOC. That's what would happen. And so I just, and I think that does happen. But at least amount. they would be in that system. You would know where they were. Well, you would. I'm just saying like the alternative I mean, I, to having them arrested, which you could easily do is to send them to Whiting, I suppose, you know, just, but, but you would ask like, what do you do if you have a pa patient you cannot manage because they're so violent and you don't have the Whiting type alternative available? My guess is you would call the police. That's, that's what emergency rooms do a fair amount. So uh, Paul, you had a question and then Nancy. Yeah, I actually, um, actually love Linda's point is that there's no appropriate facility for these people that it's whiting or jail. Um, you know, and I, I, uh, am hearkening back to the DRCT report that talked about the levels and how these, how this level system that's there is kind of the antithesis to the recovery. Everyone has an individual plan to get out. Um, and I mean, to me, it's, it's, you know, we're supposed to treat everybody the same, but everyone's supposed to have an, indiv an individual plan according to the DEMAS recovery uh, model um, and that everyone gets treated to these levels and all that is, is kind of, um, kind of goes against that. Everybody does have an individual plan. And even though there may be like, um, these specific levels that come with certain privileges that one can earn. What I, what's in my treatment plan, what I need to do to earn that might be different than what is in someone else's treatment plan that they need to do to earn that. So it, it is catered toward the, what the, the treatment goals are and, and, and thing and mechanisms are for each patient. It's the yeah. privileges that are consistent. You know, you get to this level, you have these privileges, get to that kind of thing. So, it, so it's more coercive then. <laughs> Not sure. There's an, there's an individual plan, but there's coercion of, if you do this, then we'll give you something. And if you don't, then we'll punish you. It's, it's, it's not really, not exactly it, it, it's not, well, yeah, but that's how it's sounding. It's sounding like, you know, if you do it, you say, we'll give you privileges. And if you don't, then we won't. And to go back to Linda's question, um, if you're caught up in the criminal justice system, at least you know when you're going to get out. Um, and on, on, you know, you, you go through sentencing, you have a sentence that, that, that unless it's, you know, an indeterminate sentence. But for our guy in John's hospital, who, you know, is having a hard time controlling his or her behaviors, um, that's not going to necessarily be an indeterminate sentence. There is a level of due process that that person gets that the person at the PSRB doesn't get. Um, because if the person, first of all, um, the person at, at the PSRB has to, com has to comply with a completely different set of requirements than does the civil patient. Um, and if um, you've got the PSRB and you're supposed to be looking at dangerousness and then maybe throw in a little, a little look um, at the patient's well-being, that's a completely de different set of criteria than um, the civil patient um, has got. So you've got discrimination built right there into the system between the civil patient and, and the patient who has been found not guilty. They may be a forens forensic patient, maybe the criminal justice system, the way it's working out now is still a part of it, but the patient's been found, the person's been found not guilty. Um, whether they committed the act is not the issue. They are found not guilty. 
Um, <clears throat> and we also have situations where people have very short-term mental illnesses where they were mentally ill at the time the act was committed, but it's not a chronic condition, um, which might not even make them eligible for Dima's care if it's not a chronic illness, but that's a issue we don't need to go into. But so you've got someone who was recovered from whatever the psychosis was that caused them to commit the act. But if the PSRB, which is mostly lay people, um, doesn't agree that they're not dangerous, then you've got the same civil person and the, and the forensic person, and you're gonna have completely different outcomes. Um, and if we're supposed to be looking at equity and we're supposed to be looking at, at non-discrimination in terms of how people are treated at Whiting, um, then we can't, we have to look at these two patients, put them side by side, yes, their treatment plans would hopefully be different, but you know that's an that's an issue that has been happening at at Demas facilities for a long time. That the treatment treatment plans aren't necessarily all that different. But um, but it's not. A, I think, and Linda said this as well. It's not a clinical decision to release these two people, one civil and one forensic, if they've gotten to the same place in recovery. And that's patently discriminatory. It should be a clinical decision for both of them. So um, in terms of potential recommendations on the topic of the PSRB, um, um, in the absence of someone trying to draft up a list of stuff, I mean, would it be worth it to take a look at that proposed legislation from 2018 and, 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 and maybe, because because I think the my review of it, the focus of it seemed to be changing the factors which have to be considered and adding in, uh, you know, at least an equal amount of focus on the, the patient's well-being and, and care and that type of thing. And, and Laurie, I think you had indicated you had some concerns with that legislation. Would it, you want to just mention what those are and, and so we can kick those around briefly? I mean, does everybody have it? Um, I've got it here somewhere. People have it or you're muted there, Nancy. I said, do people still have it? Do you need me to send it out again? Just did a screen share. Oh, so uh, cool. Well, you know, when you're teaching like this all the time, you get pretty good at this particular thing. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I can get rid of this. Um, so, so uh, a lot of it is just wordsmithing, sort of archaic words in, in the statutes, but hold on one second. All right, this is it. Uh, I don't know what this, well, Lori, do you have it? I mean, do you want to just mention the sections or the language that are of concern? Oh, okay. Um, well, I have, I'm looking at, uh, I also have the thing that Monty gave us, I yeah. think was the testimony that they made on behalf of it. Mm -hmm. Referring to as well. Um, the, uh, because he kind of outlines what the, the changes are or whatnot. So section two proposes a balancing test whereby the board must balance the protection of society with rights that all institutionalized so are otherwise entitled language to here. understand. It's language the federal, here. Yeah. It's being added. I mean, just beyond, I, I'm not completely comfortable with the way it's written grammatically, but um, uh, I, again, I said I, I don't disagree with adding because right now all it says in the statute is protection of society right so i don't disagree with adding that there should also be consideration of the welfare of the person along with the protection of society and 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 the addition of you know they have to basically rule out 
less restrictive placements. You know, it's, it's, yeah. to me, this reads a and little- And I think that, I mean, that that's- That's Olmstead. I wanna say that goes without saying, um, but perhaps making it more explicit in the statute would help to make it that way. Because as I said, like every time someone goes before the board, there's an adversarial process. There's someone representing the patient. There's someone representing the state and thereby representing the victim or victims. And there's the hospital and the board. So there are entities who can argue if, if the hospital is saying we're not making a recommendation for change at this time, meaning we think this is the least restrictive setting, whether that's Whiting or Dutcher, then the defense attorney can challenge that and they can ask all sorts of questions as to why that's the case and why the, the person wouldn't be able to be managed in a less restrictive setting. The board can ask, you know, all sorts of questions along those lines as well. So it, there is a process and that's what, again, things I think is a positive about it. There's a process where many voices can raise issues and call others to the, to the carpet about what's happening or not happening with an individual's care. Um, and just also, I wanna, speaking of the board, I wanna, uh, Nancy said a second ago that they were mostly lay people. I do wanna emphasize that they're not mostly lay people is represented by somebody, uh, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, um, a, an attorney or judge, uh, as well as individuals representing victims advocacy, um, probation or parole, and then a, a person from the public. So mostly. they're they're not mostly it, yeah, not mostly lay people. So uh, so my reading of the the current law is it's clear and explicit. It says the primary concern is the protection of society. End of story, right? And I think what this would do is say, okay, there's the primary concerns are threefold, right? One is the protection of balance, the protection of society. Uh, and and I, I agree, this this the way it's actually worded is a little bit unfortunate, but but it seems to want to say there's three primary concerns. One is protection of society. Two is is there a less restrictive placement available? And three to protect the rates of the patients, et cetera, right? So, and I, I think, you know, a lot of times, if, if you were a member of this board and you were gonna be a stickler based on what the law says, is like the most important thing beyond all other factors is, is safety, right? And, and that necessarily means the best interests of the patient, et cetera, et cetera, are secondary, right? So, so whether or not this is the exact way to word it, I think these three factors seem to be appropriate in terms and, and they should all weigh equally in a decision I'm, uh, yeah. because you know i just by way of a analogy it, uh, under our current laws which have been on the books for years and years and years and years in terms of um how to deal with persons accused of crimes but being pre-trial detainees right um the judges are told that they must identify the least restrictive uh set of conditions that will guarantee appearance in court, right? And 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 th then there's a list of you know an increasing level of restrictions up to and including actual pretrial incarceration, you know, setting money bail. So I, I, I think to me what this would do is it sort of forces you to rule out the least restrictive uh, placement um, rather than just opt for continued confinement in 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 Whiting, for example. So. But that's also required by by Olmstead. This this if you don't do that under the ADA, you're violating the ADA. You have to consider the least restrictive placement. Right. But which is which is why I, I like I said before, I think that th this is done. This is considered because of those things. But perhaps making it more explicit will make it more explicit and make people think about that. Um, and uh, I, you know, I. I'm reluctant to say what I'm about to say, but I think it's the case. I, I don't think the federal law can force state governments to do things, right? There's a sovereignty issue. I mean, in terms of uh, private hospitals, that's different, but, but writing this into a state statute, is assuming it matches up with Olmstead. Oh, it, you're talking about like a Pennhurst um, um, 
exemption. Um, but um, there's actually a provision in the CHRO statute that says that the state will comply with Title II of the ADA. So the state's already taken care of that. Well, but, but it's not in this statute, right? And, and, and if no. I were on this board, I would say, well, this says first and foremost is safety, so that's that. And, and what, but that's not an argument against including this language. I think the more explicit it is in the actual statute governing the PSRB, the more likely people are to abide by it. It's just yeah. these decisions, are you gonna prove someone is not in a, in a specific decision they render is not abiding by Olmstead, right? How it, I mean, it's just like a judge or a prosecutor making a discretion. Well, yeah, I mean, a judge can certainly rule that the state is violating the, the ADA. Um, if, and if, if it's um, not um, complying with the Olmstead requirements, which is, you know, to remind everybody is part of a case, it's not statutory, um, but um, a, 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 a judge can certainly find that the state is violating the ADA. But these particular rulings are being made by the PSRB. And I'm just saying, it seems like it would be logical to require them in their statute to abide by Olmstead. Yes by listing yeah. factors. I mean, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. If I were on the, this board, I'd say, okay, here's my statute. This is what I'm doing. And, and you know, it's, I, to me, it's kind of, it's kind of like I the argument that- I have a question. I, have a question. I, I, just um, want to make, I just want to make one point though, uh, because I deal with this a lot. Uh, when people talk about criminal justice reform, you know, and they start blaming prosecutors and police for this or that decision, the comeback is always, well, but the statute says, like this is a very serious right. crime with a mandatory sentence. And how are you blaming us for just following what the statute actually says, you know? And, and, and so that's why I think it's really important if you want the policy to really change, you need to change the statute so that that excuse disappears. So I'm sorry. Nancy. So my question is this, uh, just down a little bit from on this page on uh, number three, um, it says, uh, if the board finds that the acquittee is a person who should be confined, the board shall order the person, the acquittee, confined in a hospital for psychiatric disabilities. Is that how Whiting qualifies as a hospital for psychiatric disabilities? But then it goes on to say, or placed with the Commissioner of Developmental Services for custody, care, and treatment. Could somebody tell me what the... Commissioner of Developmental Services? I, I, I'm guessing because DDS is uh, um, for persons who, you know, formerly known as persons with mental retardation, that, that that's- Developmentally a, disabled, yeah. Yeah, so that's a different, you know, that's not a mental health situation subject to this kind of treatment. So it's like but, a more- but, but in actuality, this is what they're suggesting is a place for people to go. Right. Now, this, is, this is part of the existing statute. The, the court, I'm sorry, and the, the board could, if someone has, is, is a, um, a, a patient of the Department of Developmental Disabilities, uh, then they can order them placed in their custody, not in Demas's custody. Right, right. But there's, so, there's that provision. That's not a change. That's you know. And by the way, since people may be watching this and, and are looking at the screen, don't understand this legislative uh, <laughs> stuff. If you see words that are in in these brackets, that means the proposal in this bill is to eliminate those words, and stuff that's underlined would be new. And and sometimes you'll see a whole paragraph that begins with the parentheses new. That means that's whole thing being uh, added. So this is just legislative uh, format. So anyway, uh, I guess my question is, and I see your point, Dr. Hauser, uh, that it's not new, but are they doing that at all now? Is that happening? Um, I would have to ask one of my colleagues whether anybody that's that's currently under the PSRB is is committed to the Department of or to the Commissioner of Developmental Services. I don't know that offhand. I think it's unlikely that a DDS patient could end up being not guilty by reason of insanity 
only because I think first and foremost, you'd have a competency issue bef before you'd ever get to the point of uh, uh, an, uh, an insanity defense, right? But I think I mean, that goes back to a, a discussion we had a couple of weeks ago about the complete um, analysis of what is the issue with an individual. Uh, we find that some of the federal uh, agencies are not doing that. They're not looking at uh, trauma or head or any of these other things. And um, in, in sometimes it is actually a head trauma as we certainly know now uh, because of traumatic brain injury being a real topic. So sometimes some of this is uh, pathological, not necessarily uh, completely psychological. Well, and don't forget, in order to get to be not guilty by reason of insanity, you have to be competent to stand trial, right? And so- But, uh, but also don't forget that you, that somebody has to raise it. That, that Otherwise too, right? it's not questioned. Yeah, what I I'm mean, someone, like, it, competency, like, so, so people could slide through the system without anybody raising competency and then end up NGRIs. I, I suppose, but, uh, but I, I think, I, I think, well, I, I, I think- It'd be rare. Know, so someone who had like a chronic disability that is, is not subject to treatment, like for example, what used to be called mental retardation, like a severe form of that is not gonna be competent to stand trial. And I can't imagine that getting to a not guilty by reason of insanity um, right. by proceeding. It's just- Mike, it's just so we great. get language straight, you can call it intellectual disability as, as opposed to what used to be known as, because even to put it that way would be offensive in the disability community. I, I, I appreciate that. And sometimes like I talk so that people who are maybe watching this understand the category we're talking about. Yeah, but we want to get more people used to using the right terms. I agree, so. Sorry. Okay, um, so, so if I understand you correctly, Lori, you're saying that the, the intent behind adding this language is okay with you. It's just like you have a quibble with the, the exact yes. way it's worded, right? And I would if agree I could, that. If I could just rewrite it a little better, then I would be okay with it. Got it, okay. So not changing the substance at all. Right. Keeping it an equal balance between all of these three um, concerns. Yeah, like I might say primary concerns, <laughs> if you're gonna yes. have three of them, for example. And or the concerns that, you know, like it, considering it, it's, you know, the factors, the things it has to weigh. I mean, it just- I'll Equally consider or something like that, you know. But you're not putting um, the protection of society as the primary concern and the other two are um, um, of less concern. There's gonna all be weighed equally. Correct. I think that's I what mean, they in, meant in to say, say that's not what it actually says. I haven't looked in, really. part, in part, I see two and three as, um, as being sort of equivalent themselves, that it is a patient's right to have the less restrictive. So like that was part of the, they're not really three separate entities that that's, those are sort of, protection of society and the welfare of the patient um, or the, the rights of the patient to be treated in, less in the least restrictive setting. That, I like those... leaving in the statutory citation to the patient's bill of rights. Right. So I wouldn't want that taken out. Yes. Okay. And I, I would um, I'll just say that, like, I think the reason I think that these things are considered already is I mean, the, the easiest decision, if you were only primarily only considering protection of society, the easiest decision would always be to just leave the person where they are right. in the most restrictive setting. So that's why I think over the years that the, the board does consider these things, it's just not made explicit in the statute and it's perfectly appropriate to put that in. It's, it so can I says... just ask, can I just ask, to, so is it the sense of the task force that this, that we support this legislation? Well, I think what I was trying to do is get a sense from Lori which specific portions of this she has a concern with. So, that, so because because like one one thing we could potentially recommend is they go back to this bill. I forget what the bill number is. Just say, you know, uh, two two nine we, four. Yeah, just go back to this proposal and and consider implementing it right and 
leave the wordsmithing and stuff to them yeah. unless there's some substantive yeah. stuff in here that any of us have a strong concern about and that's and, and that's and yeah. that's what I've been getting at because I got the the sense from the very beginning of this discussion that we you had said Mike that there's two alternatives essentially um, either abolishing the PSRB or proposing that this um, amendment and then Lori said well there's a third option I just I'm I'm not quite sure I understand that her concerns are purely wordsmithing as opposed to substantive. And that's what I haven't really, Yeah, I don't have reassurance on that. that that's what I'm getting at. Like, I, I, would, I would like to hear from Lori or anybody else, do they have any substantive concerns with any of the provisions, any of the recommendations in this, in this bill? <clears throat> and that's what I thought we were yeah. going through. And that's what you haven't made clear. Are your, are your concerns wordsmithing or substantive? Yeah. I, I I said at the outset what pieces of this I am on board with, and that was to to change this language to add in what we're talking about to get rid of the recommitment, the opportunity for recommitment at the end of somebody's period of commitment, and to um, modify the internal movement. Um, the, the piece about internal movement is to allow for stipulation to a recommendation from the hospital to transfer from Whiting to Dutcher. Is this the recommitment language you're concerned about this? Or no? Which no, that, that one I'm fine. The Where section three was. Uh... I think when, um, and I'm, I, I wasn't entirely sure which section he was referring to, but when, when Monty Radler came to speak with us, I thought mm -hmm. that he sort of said in a nutshell that the, the main pieces of this, parts of this legislation were to get rid of the recommitment and to remove the, um, the remove the, the PSRB essentially from the internal hospital movement, the going from one to Dutcher. Got and it. I'm, I'm not totally in support of that. I, I'm in support of allowing that to be stipulated. You know, if if we make a request for transfer to Dutcher, that both parties, the defense and the state, can stipulate to that and skirt the board hearing. But I would still want the state to have an opportunity to object to that and hold a hearing. We have Got to remember it. that this is this is it's an adversarial entity it's an adversarial process that is supposed to be um looking out for the rights of the patient as well of as the rights of society and as well as the rights of the victim they're representing the victim so i don't want that to get lost in all this sorry is this section c um section oh. 3c is that what you're talking about let me get to it hold on That's this. That's what we were just talking about. I think that's what Laura's talking about. This is the, um, yeah, instead of saying may petition the court for a continued order of, or an order of continued commitment, the, it's changed to say may apply for essentially for civil commitment. Wait. Oh, is that what civil, is that what? 319 I? 319i is civil commitment. Wait, what are we looking at then? Mike, Paul has a question, by the way, there. All right, sorry, Paul. Uh, yeah. Well, we'll, just to clarify, what we're looking at is this is section 3C, right, of the of that bill. Right. This is the one to end recommitment. I, I, I just wanted to say that um, I want to like challenge Lori's statement that they already consider the stuff that they had talked about. They had considered the patient's treatment. They considered all this. I have yet to see an MOD that shows that the PSRB has, has considered this stuff. And, and so, you know, if this is going forward, they, sh they should have to on an individual basis demonstrate that they're considering 
not just safety, but the other parts of this as well, because I, no one else has seen it. And, and the funny part with this board is there's not one voice on that board for the patient. Right. And that's why an I MOD. <laughs> oh, an MOD is a me memorandum of decision. And so what happens is when someone goes before the board, they wait to get their, their um, memorandum of decision, which outlines what they can and can't do. And, and um, you know, ba basically it's the board's decision Got it. For, for their hearing. It governs where they need to be housed, what treatments they have, what, um, like Paul said, what they're, uh, if they're out in the community, what they're allowed to do, what they're allowed to have, what they're not allowed to have, things they have to, any requirements they need to adhere to. Sort of like an order of probation, you know, would be equivalent to that in the criminal justice system. Uh, I'm so confused, Lord, because Section C says if, and I think reasonable cause is way too low a standard, way too low a standard. But if reasonable cause exists to believe that the equity remains a person with psychiatric disabilities, then um, the state's attorney may go to um, may go to try to get a civil commitment. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's what you're saying. Yeah. What do you mean? So, I said I agree with this part. So what's the part you don't agree with? Well, the statute said before they could continue the commitment, and that's the part that Lori objects to. Now they're taking that out. No, they but we're, what we're talking about is what this particular amendment to the statute does. So it doesn't matter what they said before. We're looking at just what this purports to do. And and I'm saying I agree with this portion of the proposed legislation that we should end the recommitment. And when someone gets to the end of their commitment, right. if people think they're still a danger, they should be bring that up with the probate court. Right? So is there, Otherwise they should be released. Is there a part of this bill that you disagree with substantively? Uh, well, I said there, I'm not sure what section he was referring to, but I distinctly remember when Monty came and proposed, was talking to us about this. One of the elements he said was about getting rid of the PSRB's involvement, internal movements of the hospital. And I don't agree with that. In Let's see if it's in here. Wait, total. That's where I, I came up with the sort of compromise of allow the parties to stipulate and potentially skirt a board hearing. Well, I would I'm, not agree with that, but yeah. I would propose that we just put the, you know, use this bill and state that this bill is what the task force recommends. Um, and I mean, if the bill goes, if, if, if the bill is gonna be proposed this session, it's gonna get a hearing. There can be, it can be rewritten um, it won't necessarily go forward with the, these exact words. So why don't we say that, you know, in principle, this is what we agree with. It's, it, it, the language about Dutcher is not in this, in this uh, legislation. Yeah, I don't see it. I can't find it if it's there. So how about if we said something along the lines of, we recommend that the legislature reconsider, and we'll reference the number of this bill, et cetera, and in particular to add uh, an equal weight to, um, you know, the, the fact that it, it needs to be the least restrictive setting. And, and I forget exactly what the third factor was, you know, just to emphasize that, right, that we're really saying to, to could, could we could we say that we agree with the spirit and intent of this legislation, it may not be the same verbiage that comes out, but then but, say because it it takes into account the the um, the patient and uh and and it and still you know um and does not allow for it it asks for the intervention of the court system if the person has served their time um it it's it's not um i think that if we they could do it this would be great 
but it may not be the same verbiage. You know that, Mike. It can go yeah, in right. one way and come out entirely different. Right. But as long as you maintain the spirit and intent of where it was going and what it accomplished. But, but so, so all I'm suggesting is possibly recommending they reconsider this proposal. Yes. And in yes. particular, we're especially emphasizing the need to add consideration of less restrictive placement and the rights of the patients pursuant to that, that's the patient's bill of rights 17a 541 is that, is that yeah. It? yeah i mean that's been, you know it seems to me the most important thing here and, and we've already discussed with the patient's bill of rights the fact that we now you know are recommending that um whiting patients be able to be present when their rooms are searched so yeah, I, I think that's all we need to say, Mike. I think you're hundred percent right. All right. Is everybody so okay? I, I, I move I move we adopt that then. Second. So, could you say what we're 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 going to support this? I, I move that we uh, support this uh, legislation uh, with its current language, especially highlighting the protections for the patients and, and considerations for the patients in, in the bill. Well, I, I'm not sure <laughs> on that because I think there were other pieces of the legislation I, I don't know that we've, that we've looked at today that I just think they remember being not in favor of, and, and part of that had to do with um, uh, uh, what folks have access to in terms of either records or the videotapes or, or something along those lines. It, it's not in here. Some of it, huh? It's, None of it's, in it's not in here. It's not in this bill. That may have been something else that they were proposing, but it's not in this bill. Okay. Yeah. Well, did people want a chance to read it before we? Could I? Well, we've said Just, it many times. You know. I know. I don't but, have access to that right now. But, but I, I think there's a way of saying it that doesn't necessarily yes. endorse every single word of this thing. Yeah. I, I think the way of saying it is we recommend that they reconsider this particular proposal and in particular uh, that they add to the statute those two additional factors which we were just talking about. And so and leave it up to them if they want to, you know, or anybody wants to object to any specific item in here, okay. but it seems like there's nothing. The most substantive thing in here is that, as far as I can tell, is that um, eliminating the recommitment and adding those two new primary factors to the public safety. Right. Well, you know, we've but, got a motion on the floor. On the floor, yes. Seconded. So why don't we just call the question right. and vote on it? So just to restate it. Do you, Paul, do you Wait. want to see what your motion is so we all know exactly what we're doing here? That um, we, we, we recommend uh, the support of this bill and especially with, towards uh, looking at increasing uh, protections for the patients, uh, both through the Bill of Rights and through having their treatment consider, considered equally to uh, public safety. There, there is another part of this legislation, not maybe not the part that Monty was talking about or what he was referencing in that testimony. A piece about having application for temporary release or something being able to like be submitted every six months. Yeah, we yeah. Should yeah. What's in there? It's all part yeah, of it. Still there. That we're. Yeah. It's hold on. So. I mean, again, that's something that um, it's section he, section three, subsection A. Yeah. An acquittee may apply for discharge not more than once every six months. That's current law. I, right. It hasn't been amended. Right. right. This, this that that's this right. Um, so there's no change. That's what the current law is. There's a whole underlined section under section 4B, I guess. Section 4. There, that. Right. 
at, at the time of the confinement? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, any time. Release. It's a temporary release. Application for temporary release may be not filed. Right. And again, developmental services. Right, but what, what, is, what is being proposed different here? It's taking out. Something else, else. All added. This is all new. It's all added. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at below at subsection B, that's in brackets. Oh, that's that's. They're just re re relettering the section. Right. Re lettering C. That's so, right. Yeah. yeah. But this piece this, is new, so I'm just curious. This option didn't exist before. They've right. added this, right? And we right. support it because it's part. Well, of what's your problem with it, Laura? Is there a problem with it from your point? Well, of view? I, I'm. What was? I, I get the impression it might have been discretionary whether they even entertain the application. Right. Test. Okay. So say at least once okay. every six months, if you wanted to, you could apply, and you have a right to have a decision made. That seems like that's what it says. But by by, I guess by I'm trying to understand like by whom because <clears throat> they're not going to have board hearings every six months. Um, well, who are they yeah. asking? The board to do this. Board they're, they're asking the board. This is an act concerning the psychiatric security review. <clears throat> yeah, so the board will have to do that. Yeah. It says, it says the board's not required to hold a hearing on a first application, right? Any sooner than 90 days after the date of the initial hearing, right? So, I mean, there are some requests shall be oh. held later than 60 days after right. the date of the application. So, they're going to have to hold more hearings. Okay. So we've had a motion to second, and uh, we're in the discussion phase of that. And I would concur, as I always jarred my memory, I was impressed when uh, Monty came to us about this proposed legislation changes that seemed all very um, appropriate. And now that we've had an opportunity to review them ourselves again, uh, I, I would also uh, move to, when it was already motion, I'd say I suggest we move towards a vote. Okay, yeah, you move question. the question, second the question. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? All right. Well, I guess that's a consensus. That was to call the question. Now we have to go, go the main motion. Okay. Well, that All those in favor of the motion that Paul had made earlier, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, we're good. Okay. <clears throat> so the last topic is competency, right? And, and uh, so... Um, let me, if you don't mind, I'd like just to start by saying this is a this is an extremely complicated topic with multiple factors involved, all kinds of entities, judges and prosecutors, and and the the hospital itself, and on and on and on. Um, and the last time I shared with everyone uh, sort of a comprehensive national set of best practice type recommendations that seem to have emerged, and and my thought then was since I, I think it's unlikely that unless anybody has a specific recommendation we should talk about here, that, that maybe what we should recommend is that the, the, the legislature, you know, convene uh, a very specific effort to examine the data about competency restoration, you know, competency motions, et cetera, and, 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 and come up with some recommendations. And, and the thing I sent you, this entity, uh, the Council of State Government's Justice Center, which is like highly regarded and very nonpartisan and always includes all the stakeholders. Uh, they, this is the kind of thing they do. And so I'm just saying like, there are groups out there that can make this, you know, can get all the relevant people together in a room and figure this stuff out. And a lot of it is, is data intensive. Like for example, it, you know, anecdotally, it sounds like um, some courts are much more likely to order a 54, 50, 60, a competency evaluation than others. And, and maybe some do it too frequently because, you know, once you do it, it puts you in this trajectory that, you know, could, could end, end up you being in whiting even for relatively minor stuff. And, and, and beyond that, <clears throat> there's a whole group that are in the Department of Correction awaiting their competency evaluation, right? And, and a lot of that might actually be unnecessary in the first place it may just be because the court officials can't come up with a better idea. They just do that because it's available. And, you know, I, I think if I can carry the water for the 
correctional professionals in our state, you know, I, I think they're, they would be the first to tell you there's like way too many people in the jails, meaning the pretrial facilities that have serious mental health issues who are facing relatively minor charges who probably shouldn't be in that setting. So my thought is recommend in terms of a recommendation is to say that they should really get someone to focus just on this very narrow issue and figure it out and, and report back to them in a year or so. So that's my thought. <clears throat> Nancy, I mean, Linda, sorry. I think I've had a problem ever since this started when you have people that are going for competency ending up in whiting, you know, because of the, the flow of patients. I, um, I do like some of the things that Dr. Hauser found when she did her kind of uh, sampling of what's going on in America that uh, does everybody have to be, uh, in, I guess, does everybody have to be in prison or in jail to have a competency exam if, if that is, if they're not violent or I would just say that I do have a problem with and have since I heard about it, that people can come in for competency and end up from whiting. And, and don't forget the pretrial part of this, right? So people get arrested, they come into court, uh, they have some obvious behavioral issues, and um, and many people in this category don't have any resources, like they might be homeless. Um, and so even a low bail amount is going to keep them in, in jail for a while. And, and in many of these kinds of cases, uh, competency evaluation is ordered because I think the lawyers involved, the judges and the prosecutors and the public defenders, don't know what else to do, right? And so they just like, we want some mental health professionals to figure this out and let us know what they think. And so as a result, for a month or two, you could be sitting in a correctional center waiting for your competency evaluation and you're probably going downhill fast in that setting and that's not helping anybody. And, and I think the, the goal is to identify people who don't need to be incarcerated, meaning they don't actually a present danger to everybody and figure out better ways of uh, you know, giving, making sure the police and the prosecutors and the judges and the public defenders have other options besides that one. Maybe they do in Connecticut. Maybe they're just not aware of them. Maybe it's an education issue, but but it's a systemic problem that I think needs a systemic solution. So that's my thought. Laurie? Yeah. Um, what do folks think about the some version of the recommendation I made about um, convene a multidisciplinary, multi-agency board of stakeholders in forensic mental health, including all these people and meet quarterly, discuss issues, policies, recommendations. I mean, I had it broad to forensic mental health, but it could also be more specific to particularly competency restoration. And then also, in a, I guess, in parallel to that, to say that <clears throat> that, that group of people also um, consider the recommendations made by this Council of State Governments um, document that was put out in how to you know kind of reshape competency in this state. Well, That's speaking for good. myself, I'm, I'm fine for that. But I just think, however this happens, it's gonna, it really needs a lot of data. You really need to figure out what's really happening. And, and that's, you know, not something, you know, it's like not something we can do, right? We, we have no staff or anything like that. So somebody has got to figure out how to assemble all this data from all these different entities and, and make sense of it. So Dr. Rhodes. And here. No, I, I would agree. I think, I'm not sure you and Lori are saying anything actually different. I, I think, and I would concur that uh, we, and I, I thought this, I actually read this pretty carefully and I thought it was great by the way. And it looks like, uh, and, and I get it. You can't just tell people, Hey, why don't you just do this? Make, take on their recommendations. Cause part of the process is getting the stakeholders together to, to get their buy-in. But I would totally concur with the recommendation to uh, convene a multidisciplinary panel, I guess, all stakeholders as Lori alluded to, to uh, readdress the issue of competency with the idea of streamlining, improving the current processes. Because to Linda's point, I think we all agree that you don't really you don't want to spend a long time in whiting. It's not good for anybody, actually, right? It's not good for the patients, first and foremost. And it certainly doesn't really help the whiting staff to be also encumbered with folks just there for competency. So I think it's uh, you know kind of preload reduction, I guess you'd call, you'd call it cardiology. Let's keep get those people out of the whiting environment 
to do an, have an efficient, whatever, however efficient process we want to have for a competency. So uh, again, I think it's important for us to make that recommendation. Uh, I think we could suggest how they do it. I think we could give them some uh, literature to support them, uh, but I would totally concur with all that. Oh, you have your hand up. So, so my huge problem with that report is, first of all, it's judges and doctors primarily getting together and saying, okay, judges, you do this, doctors, you do this, and we're good. There's very, very minimal voice of people in recovery. There's very minimal voice of uh, people who actually stand up for the rights of people. Um, and and it, it's to the point where it's tokenized, where they're on an advisory committee, but there's no real main voice of people of, of lived experience on that committee. So there's no way I can support that report at all. I think I think the recommendations that they make are just archaic. Um, it's actually turning mental health backwards instead of forwards. There's there's nothing innovative about it. It's 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 just you know, more system creating more system and, and the cost of which, where does the cost of all this come out of? Um, that's the big one because, you know, I'm sure, you know, you look at uh, some of the proposals in that, uh, I'm sure Whiting is not willing to give up, you know, 32 million, $40 million of its budget to do this. To, to do what? To, to do the, these recommendations from that report. I think my reading of it was these are just things that happen elsewhere in the country that you might consider to be best practices, but you know, every state is different. So I'm just, I think the, the important, my personal opinion is I think the important thing here is get all the relevant stakeholders together, make sure they have access to all the data they got to have and somebody who can put it all together for them and then figure out the system because clearly there's just a lot of unintended consequences at the moment. So, um, I don't think the report says do this or do that. It just says, here's a bunch of stuff that has happened elsewhere. And here's, here's what the outcomes were. And here's the kinds of problems you should look for, but I'm not pushing any report. I'm only saying that this is something that is a clear systemic problem. And anecdotally, there's a lot of things you could point at that are driving unintended consequences, including too many people ending up at whiting and, and somebody needs to figure it out. That's all and I think, and I think, but I didn't hope I didn't misspeak, Paul, because I concur with everything you said. And I actually would add, Mike, that in that recommendation we make, we make it clear that the entire competency process be reevaluated and ensuring that the multidisciplinary group that we've alluded to, the current stakeholders, include uh, folks that are in recovery, patient advocates, et cetera, yeah. to be uh, sure. inclusive. Uh, so I totally agree with that. And I, I would also say that we should make it um, or encourage them to, to put people in that group that are close to the work, like the, um, you know, the, the people that are actually doing the work rather than the, the, the people higher up, you know, so like the, the CJ pack um, uh, that you've mentioned a couple of times, like I know it's, it's made up of, a, you know, the, the commissioners of a bunch of different agencies. Well, the commissioner of Demas isn't going to be able to speak to what happens on the units at Whiting with regard to competence. They wouldn't know, you know, kind of what's happening with who's getting diverted and who's not and which courts are at a problem, which courts isn't and how outpatient restoration works in certain areas versus others. So it's got to be the people that actually are close to the work that are brought in to, to make some of these um, uh, suggestions or recommendations. So, um, and I, I don't think that, you know, that this report, um, for starters, I think I said before, you know, Connecticut's often looked at as on one of the, um, as one of the gold standards with respect to a lot of uh, things in forensic mental health, but particularly in competency. Um, so there's actually, you know, people far worse than us, but, but a lot of these recommendations that are outlined in this, I don't think, as I said, I don't think they're antithetical to the things that we've been talking about diverting more people out of the hospital into an outpatient um, setting where that's possible, you know, getting jail diversion involved more um, quicker, um, looking at the data, providing education to various aspects of the system so that people are using, you know, these mechanisms appropriately. But um, so I'm, I'm kind of surprised, Paul, to hear you say that you, you didn't support 
agree with any of it because like some of it are absolutely things that we've been talking about this whole time about diverting some of the resources to the um, and, and 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 so the thing that that i i um in 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 answer to that yes that's some of the things that we've been talking about but but the process and the stuff that that things get how they get looked at and what gets looked at matter um you know in in particular um the um the reference to involuntary outpatient commitment that should be a non-starter for for anyone um you know there's just, there's just stuff in there that historically racially like with involuntary outpatient commitment if you're black you're five times more likely to have an order placed on you if you're hispanic you're two and a half times more likely um you know so it's like yes i think that we have to look at restoration we have to look at community restoration but we also have to look at how we're doing that and that we're, we're we still have dignity and we're doing it in ways that make sense for connecticut instead of what what else is being done around the country um I agree with everything Paul says. Um, I'm also concerned because I think it's really difficult in putting together something like you're talking about to have people who are from the psychiatric survivors networks. Um, and um, I also am concerned because Laurie, if you say Connecticut is doing so well, then boy, the rest of the country is really in, in having real problems, but because I think Connecticut is having real problems. And I'm really afraid that putting together a group, even if it includes sort of the people lower down, as you suggest, and that's obvious, that's a very good suggestion. Um, and we get into, you know, people, a real representation of people from the psychiatric survivors um, movement which that did not have at all. I mean, they proudly state that they had one person with lived experience. That's, um, but I also feel like in a little, in a way that we are um, um, giving up our responsibilities to come up with recommendations for this um, because we're nearing the end of our tenure. Um, we've had, robust discussions about everything else that's part of our charge. And I'm not sure why this one we say, well, let's create another task force. Um, that's just another way of, you know, no disrespect intended, but that's another way of not getting something done. Um, create a task force. It's the, the last language movement, people in the movement, any movement, whatever it is, want to hear. Um, so, um, Do you have any recommendations, Nancy? Well, I think that, I mean, it's 305, we've lost John already. Um, I, I think that, you know, if we could at our next meeting talk about what we think recommendations should be and make a set of recommendations, um, you know, particularly focusing on that it should be outpatient um, and moving from there that if we make a list of what we, we and, and I also get concerned about talking about best practices uh, because I think one of you said maybe Mike that it, the, the, the report was a list of best practices throughout the country. Well, it depends upon who you're getting those best practices from. If you're getting them from doctors, it's one set of best practices from clinicians it's a different set of best practices. People with lived experience, it's a completely different set of best practices. So the whole term best practices is, um, it's too, it's easy to say, um, to, to just look at something and take it because it, it has been called best practices. So I'd say we use our next meeting to actually go through what we think I mean, we're, we've been tasked as being the experts right now um, by nature of us being on this task force. So let's put our heads together and we've been doing this for a long time and see what we can come up with as ideas that should be considered. Well, I, and I just want to be clear, um, 
I think the goal of that particular initiative was to have fewer people in jails who were there mainly because they had a serious mental illness and no one could think of what else to do with them. And that was the point. Right. And, and I know some I people. I think the outcomes are where, where certain uh, changes were made, there were fewer people incarcerated because there, no one else could realize what, no one else could figure out what to do. With that. And, and to me, like, that's the problem, right? There, there's, there's definitely way too many people sitting in jails right now in Connecticut where they're mainly because they have a serious mental illness. They do not pose a public safety danger to anybody else. And, and that's it. So what needs to happen for that not to take place? That's really complicated. And some of it is culture, some of it is resources. And so, you know. And there are too many people sitting in psychiatric hospitals too. Yeah, but they're not there because they're a competency to stand trial problem. So that's my proposal that we do that next meeting. Okay. All right, so do we know when our next meeting is? I thought we scheduled them every like other Friday, Friday, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I have to say on Fridays, it's really tight for me to get one from one place to another. So that's, I was wondering if we could make it a 1.30 oh, sure. instead of one, because then I could be here. Uh, I don't know yeah. why John has to leave at three. I think he had a meeting at three. Is that an every week meeting or is that just today? I don't know. He seems like the kind of guy who just schedules things back to back to back. So even if it was one fifteen, I think I could make it. But <clears throat> right now it's um. Yeah, I mean, that, I don't have a problem with that. One thirty is fine. So yeah. how about I will? Uh, I, I don't see who's on here. Uh, Lindsay, are you still listening to us? Um, I think Lindsay and Beverly. Oh, yeah. Beverly, okay, they're yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> well, in any event. Um, I think there's a consensus. We'd like to switch this to a start time of 1.30 for, for our next meetings. I don't think that's a big hassle. And, and if that could be communicated to everyone, um, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. So next time we'll talk about uh, the competency process and, and, uh, and we still have our pending survey of the employees. But I think beyond that, it's, those are all of our topics we're supposed to weigh in on, right? Mm -hmm. I just want to say the minutes from the last meeting were very good. Awesome. Okay. Whoever did them. So it's Cass. Good job, Cass. <laughs> Cass. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm going to be doing them again. So, right. Okay. So, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So move. So move. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Okay. We're out of here. All See right. you in two weeks.